Once again, it was not to be the whirlwind's day. <sighs> oh, hey there kiddos. Hope you're all having a good day. Today should be a pretty fun video as we finally get to see Coltane and the Seventh in action instead of just the aftermath. It's also our first time seeing a full-scale battle in the series, and it's a pretty good introduction to Maul's on tactics. Duger has rejoined the Seventh just in time to observe and participate in the crossing of Sakala River. Type, 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 type. Graceless the editor here. I've been trying to finish this video for quite a while now, uh, and unfortunately I just realized that Graceless the scriptwriter is kind of a moron. Uh, he never actually put in a decent amount of background information leading up to these events. So, uh, I figured I should probably do that now. We've got Coltane, who was in charge of the 7th Army in Hussar. He was sent there along with several thousand Wiccans uh, after a meeting with Lacine, where she actually decided to do something about all of seven cities being about to pop off. Uh, so... She finally took a little bit of action, not sure why she didn't really do anything about the very obviously corrupt people, but you know, that's politics aside. So Coltane shows up and is in charge of the 7th Army. He starts training, starts buying up wagons, herds, supplies, everything that he needs because he understands what's about to really go down here on this continent. So when it does finally pop off, He's able to actually counterattack and save about 15,000 Malzon refugees from the city of Hassar, and they book it out of town. Unfortunately, there's not any other safe towns or harbors pretty much in the entire continent. The only other place that we know for sure as the reader that's safe is Aaron, uh, which has Aaron's Legion in it. But besides that, we don't know of any actual safe harbors. So, Coltane has been marching uh, for several months, and there's only one actual battle that takes place. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't get to see the battle itself, we just see the aftermath through Diker. And it's pretty clear that the Malazans won. Since then, Camus Rilo has kind of backed off. He's having his Tythancy horse tribes actually harass the train and the Malazans, not giving them any rest, performing raids, trying to hit the supplies. You know, all the good guerrilla tactics, basically, and just kind of biding his time. They're also sending all of the other Malzahn refugees that are still alive, who actually made it through those first couple days and all the torture and everything. Uh, he's rounding them all up and pushing them towards Coltane and his army. So we have Coltane, whose troops haven't been able to get any rest, have a bunch of refugees that they have to protect, and the refugees haven't been able to get rest either, and they also don't have very many supplies, so it's kind of a bad situation. But anyway, we have Coltane going for a few months, trying to find a safe place. Uh, I believe currently they're heading to Uberid, uh, Ubarid, uh, I don't remember the pronunciation for it, but... So we've got an army coming from the north, who's going to attack them on the west side, and we've got Camus Rilo coming up behind them, who's going to be attacking on the east side. So not very good situation for the Malzans while they still have to protect about 30,000 refugees at this point. And now I'll hand you back over to Graceless, the voice actor, where he's going to go into the, the actual crossing. All right. Throughout almost all of human history, river crossings have been a very common location for battles, as they are incredibly important for strategic, territorial, and logistical reasons. In addition, a hasty river crossing is one of the most complicated and dangerous missions to execute, as you won't be able to control the battlefield nor present all of your troops at one time. Coltane is in an especially difficult position for a few reasons. First, he has to go up against two full armies, one on each side of the river. Second, in addition to his own army, he has 30,000 refugees, a large herd of cattle, and hundreds of wagons full of wounded that all need to cross, which will take a very long time. And thirdly, his army has been harassed nearly constantly for months, the enemy being content to whittle away at the Malazans while awaiting a location to force a large-scale battle such as this crossing. Despite being overwhelmingly outnumbered, Coltane has two advantages in the battle to come. Due to the grueling pace that the Malzans have maintained, they reached the river before either of the two armies. 
allowing some of his army to set up pickets on the opposite shore of the river so that way he can hold both the entrance and the exit of the crossing. In addition to that, his warlocks have access to spirits, something that most mages have forgotten about. The reason why this is such a huge advantage is because, due to the Path of Hands going on, no other mages can access their warrens. Before I get into the disposition of the allied and enemy forces, I'd like to give a short lesson on geography and river crossing types, in this case specifically oxbows and fords. If you already know about these, then go ahead and skip to the time shown, as this is mostly a background to help people imagine the battlefield and explain why I created my map the way I did. Now, to jump into fords, here's a short discussion from Lindy Beige, one of the YouTube greats. In the, the olden days, getting across a river was a little bit more complicated quite often, and bridges were quite a bit rarer than they are today. Now, uh, the first uh, obvious way you can get across a river is you can ford it. So you can, you can cross at a ford, a, a shallow bit. Now, of course, a ford can be natural, but fords, uh, where they were used fairly often by man, had to be maintained. They had to be contrived. Uh, the, the, the floor of the ford was very often cobbled or paved uh, to make it harder and more resistant to being washed away. So a certain amount of effort went into contriving the ford in the first place and keeping it uh, as a working ford. And now there are some big advantages and some quite definite disadvantages of fords. Uh, one, you probably have spotted already, is you get your feet wet. Uh, all going well, maybe just to the ankle, uh, up to the knee perhaps. You wouldn't want to go much deeper than that, all going well. But yes, uh, that's one disadvantage. Um, whereas an advantage is it turns out that uh, the Earth's crust is really thick and can su support very heavy loads. It's extremely buoyant, the tectonic plate on its, on its uh, sea of magma below, uh, much more uh, buoyant than a boat on a river could uh, ever be, and much stronger than a bridge. So you can get massive loads in your huge wagon across a ford, which might threaten the local bridge. If you enjoy learning about fun oddities and history, Lindy Beige is an amazing channel and you should definitely check him out. I love his conversational videos. As he was saying, a ford takes advantage of a shallow point in a river and is often paved by human hands, as is the case in the Sakala Crossing. Due to the sheer size of this river, the ford has an average depth of one and a half arm spans and a width ranging from three to four arm spans. This is very deep for a ford, and along with an inch of muck along the bottom, it will make for a very, very slow crossing for the tens and thousands of refugees, soldiers, and cattle. Coltane cannot afford this. An extended battle will cause far too much attrition among his troops, and even if they finish the crossing, it will be a Pyrrhic victory. To speed up the process and to give his troops better odds, Coltane geniusly orders the engineers to essentially turn the wagons into a makeshift roadway. The engineers used cut stone to fill the wagon beds so that when they are packed together they will form a raised paving that will drastically reduce the depth of the ford and the crossing time. Once Coltane's road is in place, the refugees and troops will be walking along the tops of the wagons, allowing for swift travel. The other term I'd like to define for you is the oxbow, so that we can visualize even more of the battlefield. As a kid, I didn't actually understand what Ericsson meant by a oxbow island or anything like that, and when I was doing a little bit of background for the video, oxbow island pretty much has zero results, so I'm inferring a little bit, but it should be pretty accurate. Rivers that form on plains tend to meander a lot, with winding curves that cause erosion. Over time, the course of the river itself changes due to this erosion, or sometimes flooding. Okay, so here we have a nice little graphic that helps to explain how an oxbow lake is formed. Uh, as you see, we have the meander of the river, and along the outside edges of the curves, the water's going to be going a lot faster, and so it's going to be causing a lot more erosion. As we can see, the, area, the red areas are going to be getting eroded away. The yellow areas, where the water will be going much slower, is where that material gets deposited. Uh, and so as time goes on, 
it'll wear away more and more until you get kind of pinched edges here and either through flooding or the erosion finally taking fully place it's gonna pinch off and now the river's gonna go just straight through and where this uh, bend in the river was before there's now going to be an oxbow uh, or just a segment of water that is isolated out over here. Here's a pretty fun graphic that I found for uh, changes in the Mississippi River over time. Uh, there's a lot of changes as you can see it's pretty pretty fun to look at. Obviously there's a lot of different pathways for a river to take and it's not just forming oxbows but there's quite a few of them in there if you take the time to take a look. Here's a couple pretty drastic examples that researchers were able to find using LIDAR which is a pretty fun technique. Uh, it's also how they're finding a lot of different types of ruins in ancient cities that are down in like South America and stuff. When the oxbow gets left behind there's going to be a lot of water oftentimes it turns into kind of a marshy area. Uh, such as we see on the battlefield. So then this is the map that I ended up making for the Sakala Crossing. Here is the oxbow that I mentioned. Now, realistically, the oxbow would be much more pronounced and more of a uh, extended shape. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a very good artist, and I kind of had to work with what I had. So here's the oxbow. And then this, uh, this segment of land here would be what I consider the Oxbow Island, uh, which would just be a slight built-up hill that uh, was either there causing that original meander or was from deposited materials as the river eroded away the land. Uh, and then uh, the dark discoloration is the fact that it's swampy, so it's going to be very watery. There's a little bit of a wooden slate bridge that goes over it. Uh, so I did my best to try to show what that actually looked like. And then, after I made this and went through all that work, uh, I realized in my further readings that the oxbow, where the, the trail actually goes across the oxbow island, is technically to the south down here, so it would have been going up over here. But I don't feel like doing another couple hours of work to fix that, unfortunately, so... <laughs> But yeah, that's, a, that's about all there really is to the oxbows themselves, and hopefully that helps explain what the actual map would look like and a little bit of why I made my choices the way I did. Now that we understand the battlefield, let's talk about troop placements. On the east side of the river is the First Whirlwind Army, led by High Mage Camist Relo. In the southeast are the tents of the Peasant Horde, numbering well over 20,000. Closer to the Malazan pickets are the Hasari and Siok infantry. To the north of the roadway lie the Tythansi tribesmen, mostly composed of mounted lancers. Attempting to flank the Malazans, a force of Siok cavalry headed south to Lenbarl village to come up along the river. Then to finish the encirclement far to the north is the command post of Camistrilo, on a hill overlooking what will soon become a killing field. This command post contains Rilo's elites and two legions of archers. The Malazan encampment on the east side of the Sakala contains 30,000 refugees on the Oxbow Island, and lining the roadway are the massive herds of cattle and many hundreds of wagons containing wounded and supplies. Defending these non-combatants are Coltane and the Crow Clan to the south near the village, the Hisari Guard and remnants of the Sialk Marines along the pickets, and north of the roadway are the Weasel Clan, consisting largely of mounted lancers and bowmen. The western side of the river is being held by the bulk of the Seventh, who are joined by the Foolish Dogs Wiccan Clan. In addition, each troop location will have a Wiccan warlock with them to act as immediate communication. The second whirlwind army coming from the north is the Garan army, largely consisting of heavy infantry, though there are cavalry as well. They are joined by the Semk, a very large tribe known for their ferocious warriors and sorcerers, and another group of Tythansi lancers. The Semk have a direct relationship with their god and are able to access its warren, meaning their sorcerers will be able to use magic, making them a large threat. The battle is expected to happen with the dawn, so Coltane doesn't have any time to lose. It is decided that the crossing order will be 
wagons, cattle, refugees, and finally the soldiers. The wagons begin crossing shortly after setting up camp. They were chosen first to allow the makeshift raised road to be put into place, which will drastically speed up the overall crossing. This process takes the entire night, and as dawn arrives, the cattle start to cross as the battle finally begins. With the daylight, a large dust cloud was put into place by a spirit to cover the crossing. This is to keep the enemy from seeing how quickly the crossing was taking place, so they wouldn't try pressing too hard. If the enemy knows the crossing is happening so quickly, they would press their advantage and easily overwhelm the Malazans. To the east, Camist Relo's forces have formed up. The Hisari and Sialk infantry to the south, Tithansi horse warriors in the center, and Hisari lancers to the north. The infantry begins advancing, and the two mounted forces charge toward the Weasel Clan lines. Wiccan bowmen and lancers surge forward to meet them, but the charge is a feint, and the rebels wheel away. They don't break the charge soon enough, however, and the Wiccan bowmen get off a volley at them. The lancers surge forward, killing wounded, grabbing arrows, and tying ropes around dead horses to pull them back to the encampment. It's an excellent showcase of how desperate they are for food and supplies. Nothing gets wasted. The Wiccans pull back, and the rebels move forward at a slower pace. Behind the Hisari and Sialk infantry is the peasant army, which is being affected by the spirits of the land, making them uneasy and unable to charge, but you can sense that the tide is building. On the opposite side of the river, the Semk have begun clashing with the Malazan forces, and sorcerous blasts can be heard. Nether, one of the child warlocks, is sent to assist using spirits, along with the Redblades, whose leader have ototeral links woven into their chainmail to deaden magical effects. The Foolish Dog Clan also engages with the Garan Cavalry, however, the heavy infantry has not arrived to the battlefield yet. To the south, Coltane and the Crow are near the village to engage with the Sialk Cavalry as they move toward the malls on flanks which was anticipated as a predictable move by Camist Relo. The Hisari and Sialk infantry finally makes contact against the Eastern Front. They and the cavalry push very hard, causing the Weasel Clan and Marines to pull back to secondary battlements. At the same time, Relo's two legions of Tithansi archers come down to attack from the north, which is undefended except for a thicket of dead trees. It turns out this was a trap. Sormo had made a deal with the Thirsty Spirit and promised it a day of warm blood. The archers can be heard screaming as many were pulled down into the soil to a horrifying death. The remaining archers understandably retreated back up the hill, and during this retreat, the cattle finished crossing. With nothing blocking the refugees now, all 30,000 of them begin a mad dash toward the crossing as the Wiccans and Malazan Marines are forced to retreat farther and farther back. They must hold at the bridge and swamp, but with how quickly they are pulling back, there is a real danger of a full rout. Due to the Malazan backpedaling, the peasant horde is also gaining confidence and begins surging forward behind the enemy infantry. We are then treated to a horrifying scene on the eastern edge of the Oxbow Island as the earth splits and skeletons emerge from the ground. Thing is, this was the site of an ancient battle, and the spirits have awoken the participants of the battle. The skeletal warriors laugh with delight as they surge forward through the malls on lines and charge at the Hisari and Sialk infantry. Understandably, being charged by animated skeletons is terrifying, and the infantry breaks and retreats, pushing up against the peasant army. This retreat buys the Malazan's precious time to regroup and recover, but it doesn't last long. As is often the case, skeletons by themselves are not very sturdy, especially against blunt force trauma. Combined with their pitted and corroded weapons breaking against the modern infantry armor, the natives soon figure out that, while terrifying, the skeletons are not much of a threat and quickly cut them all down. During the brief rest, the Malazans reorganize their lines. Marines and auxiliaries held the front of their defensive line, and the Weasel Clan of the Wiccans rode behind the line with archers and lancers, supporting the line wherever it seemed about to buckle. The Wiccans here were being led by the warlock Nil, and he seemed to be able to sense weak points before they faltered, miraculously keeping the defensive line from collapsing. This wouldn't be able to last much longer, however. 
Sensing a victory, the peasant horde pushes hard against the backs of the infantry, and even Camus Rilo's elite heavy troops begin marching down from their hill behind their archers. The Malazan refugees are mostly through the crossing by now, being shepherded by members of the Crow Clan. But the Malazans must keep holding against the overwhelming odds, since Coltane and the rest of the Crow Clan are still near the village to the south. After the refugees are no longer visible through the dust cloud, the Malazan line shrinks back further and further. Mounted Weasel Clan warriors begin pulling out wounded soldiers two or three at a time, and just as the line is about to collapse, the Hasari and Sialk stop pushing. Nil calls out the full retreat, relaying orders from Coltane himself, and everyone is gathered up to gallop to the ford as the peasant horde now surges after them, seeking a bloody victory. Without any resistance, the horde covers ground very quickly. Just as they reach the ford, Coltane and the crow come charging down the hill to the south, after driving off the Sealk cavalry. The entrance to the ford is now clogged by the peasant horde, and it doesn't look good for Coltane. Before reaching them, however, Weasel Clan riders perform a counterattack, bursting out of the dust cloud to push back and confuse the horde. This allows just enough room for Coltane's crow to perform a slicing attack and push through to cross the river. When the Weasel Clan pulls away, the entirety of the Malazan forces have now crossed. This feels like a moment of relief. All of the refugees, herds, wagons, and soldiers are fully across the river, but then you remember that everyone is still trapped between two armies, and there is a massive peasant horde about to slam into the Seventh's flank now. Thankfully, the engineers thought ahead since they are commanded by the greatest tactician in the Malazan Empire. When they were ordered to modify the wagons that carried the wounded into a new foundation for the ford, the engineers took the liberty of adding Malazan munitions along with the cut stone. In order to maximize the damage, the engineers wait for the ford to be full of the horde before pulling the fuse. The resulting explosion is disgustingly large, and honestly a bit of overkill in hindsight. They used the last of their cussers, but they were well served by it. The ford is now completely destroyed, and there must be a huge crater where the crossing once stood. Relo's army is completely cut off. They will have to travel to the north to find another crossing point, and will take at least ten days to catch up to the Malazans again. With their backs sealed off, the Malazans can now focus their attention on one front and bring all of their remaining forces to bear. On this front of the battle, the Malazan troops are being engaged by the Semk warriors in a frenzied melee. The Semk are supported by the Tithansi lancers to their west, and approaching to the east are the Guran heavy infantry legions. The Guran cavalry has already been driven away. The heavies have yet to close with the Malazans and with Camus Rilo's army being removed from the fray, the leader of the Garan army appears to be having second thoughts about committing to an all-out battle. This hesitation is further reinforced as Coltane and the Crow warriors slam into the Tithansi flank, quickly causing them to crumble and exposing Semk footmen to Wiccan arrow fire. The heavies refuse to engage in battle, and with so many Semk now being killed, they eventually break and retreat. With that, the battle is over. Coltane shores up his defenses, and his army spends the rest of the day tending to wounded and preparing pickets. We can now take a tally of the losses. The marines and auxiliaries that guarded the east took very heavy losses. The weasel clan didn't fare much better, though their main concern is a lack of horses. The seventh's main troops held well against the Semk, though they took a decent amount of losses and a disproportionate percentage were leadership. The biggest loss besides that were two of the warlocks, which really sucks because there were only a few of the kids at this point. So, what are the lessons we learned from this battle? Coltane planned for the scenario. We find out that he had entire herds of cattle ready and waiting. We also learn that in the subsequent time since leaving Hisar, Coltane has earned the complete loyalty among his troops. We learn that Camistrilo is not a very good military tactician. He's really just a high mage. This is causing him to underestimate the Malazans just because there's so few of them left. We also see that the enemy is willing to bide their time, only having major battles where they pick ahead of time. 
and since they can outrun the Malazans, they will always be able to be a step ahead of them. And lastly, we see the Malazan nobility refusing to acknowledge reality, foreshadowing why this event will be referred to as the Chain of Dogs. Well, that's everything I have for this video. This was honestly a lot more work than I was expecting it to be. So if I could get some feedback in the comments if you liked the battle scene or suggestions, maybe some arrows on things next time to really point out who I was talking about. Uh, anyway, I hope you all have a great day and see you next time.